Chag Sameach and Good Yantif. We're almost excited for Sukkot as we are for Guardians playoff baseball. Almost. It sort of does look like a bat and a ball, right? I don't know. Maybe the rabbis knew something. We all know that saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. But when life gives us etrogim, then what? On today, the first day of Sukkot, Zman Simchatenu, the festival of booths, we celebrate the fall harvest, our connection to the land, gratitude for our bounty. We're reminded when our ancestors dwelled in temporary structures, wandering the wilderness for 40 years under God's divine protection, the clouds of glory, and the promise that God will always watch over and protect us from any trouble every single day. We read today in our Torah reading, on the first day of Sukkot, you shall take the fruit of the Hadar tree, branches of palm, bows of leafy trees, willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before God seven days. And that's exactly what we've started. Of course, this describes the Arba Minim, the four species, the four different plants and fruits which, which we use on our holiday, the willow, the myrtle, the palm branch, and the citron, which we, of course, call lulav and etrog. So when life gives us etrogim, we should stop and smell the etrogim. The fruit of your beautiful tree, Eitz Pri Hadar, also means, Hadar means to dwell, and to dwell on something. Because unlike other seasonal trees, the Netrog tree produces fruit all throughout the year, all year long. And we should stop and smell the Etrog, the sweet lemony scent, slow down and appreciate all the wonderful gifts that we have in our lives with gratitude and bounty. When life gives you etrogim, take your time and pick the best. This week, Trader Joe's was selling lemons for 49 cents, but I can guarantee you this was more than 49 cents. Perhaps you bought the $40 pack, the $50 pack, the $100 pack, the $1,000 etrog pack, the $10,000 etrog pack. They exist, trust me. They say that there are those who pay for their etrogim with diamonds. It's a mitzvah to get the most beautiful etrog, the highest quality one in order to sanctify the holiday. And I may have seen some members of our own synagogue opening up all 60 etrog boxes that we got to make sure that they picked the best one. That person might even be here in our sanctuary at the moment. The rabbis say we should find the best one in order to sanctify the holiday, the Hidor Mitzvah, with the beautification of the mitzvah. But to be quite honest, I've always found it jarring. After spending Aseret Yumei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance, the days of beginning with Rosh Hashanah and ending Yom Kippur, when we are supposed to look inside of ourselves, not at our outsides. Those days are days of self-reflection and introspection, which we just completed. When we all wear white, we're actually also all supposed to wear the same exact thing to show that we are equal, that no one is better than anyone. When we are judging our own souls and working to improve our own ways, making better choices, as soon as we finish this internal work of self-correction, we select the etrog and the lulav where there are intricate laws specifying what they are supposed to look like on the outside, where looks and appearances seem to be most paramount. That best etrog is supposed to be symmetrical. Its left side is supposed to match its right side. The pitom is supposed to be straight up, not slanted. This one's a little slanted to the right. I didn't get the most perfect one. Someone else took it. That's right here. <laughs> but the rabbis teach a phrase which is known as tocho kivoro, that our insides are supposed to match our outsides. And since we've done our best working on beautifying our insides during the holidays, so too the perfect etrog is supposed to be an outer manifestation of that, a sign that our insides match our outsides, that we are more complete at this moment after celebrating Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and we can really begin the year on the right foot. When life gives you etrogim, appreciate the bumps and the bruises. An etrog is required to be bumpy. 
In fact, it is not acceptable for it to be fully smooth. The bumpier, the better. There's a Yiddish proverb that says the smoothest path, the smoothest path is the hardest. Rabbi Naomi Levy writes in her book, To Begin Again, in climbing it is the smoothest surface that is the most treacherous. A rough, rocky landscape is fertile ground for ascension. If you want to rise up, don't fear the bumps. Turn every stone into a step. Whatever bumps in life we face, we have to use them as stepping stones to rise even higher. And perhaps that's why our etrog has to be bumpy. When life gives you etrogim, let your heart shine. The four species are compared to our body, the lulav, the long branches, to our spine, that we should stand straight and tall, like our own name, B'nai Yashurin, the children of the upright, and that we're supposed to follow the upright path, follow our beliefs and stand up for those with no voice. The willow looks like a mouth, that we should speak words of Torah, words of truth, words of compassion. The myrtle is like our eyes, that we should always have a good eye, like our guardian's hitters, that we should know when things are right or wrong, a ball or a strike, and that we should always look at people with compassion. And finally, the etrog symbolizes our heart. Our heart should be a glow, a fire, not just filled with light, but it also should shine upon others, sharing our love and our kindness for all. When life gives you etrogim, handle life with care. Etrogs, as you probably know, are fragile. A distinguishing element of the etrog is its tip, the fragile pitom, the pollination point. We must treat everyone and everything with care. When life gives you etrogim, find what you are missing. The Vilna Gaon says that the etrog is left out of the lulav, right? The lulav is three of the four species, leaving each of us with the role of unifying, of connecting that which is separate, that which is outside of us. We are charged with being the conduits for harmony to bring what is separate together, united once again. The etrog is meant to be held together with the lulav, not alone. This teaches us the power of community coming together for a greater purpose. When life gives you etrogim, shake the etrog. When we hold the lulav and etrog together, all four species in our hands on Sukkot morning, we're instructed to shake them all around in every direction, north, so we start east, of course, east, south, west, and north, and up and down, reminding us that God is all around us. Do we shake because we're terrified? We're afraid, trembling with fear? No. We shake because we are shaking with joy, or better, dancing for joy, just like we will do next week on Simchat Torah. We learn how to shake from the word lulav, which can also be read as low love, one's heart, spreading a ray of light from our heart. When we shake the lulav in each direction, I learned this from uh, my Chabad rabbi at college at Penn, that the way that everyone shakes the lulav different, by the way, if you look. But the way that I was taught from my Chabad rabbi at Penn was you actually start from your heart. You draw the lulav into you first, and then you reach out and draw it back in. Three times, out and in, out and in. Not, you know, we, we do this a lot, right? It's not just a symbolic shake, but an out and in, an out and in. Why do we start at our heart, we push out, and then we draw back in? Each time the lulav is shaken, it should be performed with that mosin where we reach out and then draw back in because this should be our path in life. We should reach out to others and then draw them in close to us. That's how we make friendships. That's how we build bridges. That's how we engage more within our community and our congregation. We have to initiate the action to reach out. So when wife gives us etrogim, we should all say, Chag Sameach. Good yontov.